Here we are. It's live. What is up? Dude, I'm excited to do this, man. Welcome okay. to the MD show. MD show, the initial pre-launch launch. Yeah, you guys are going to have to bear with us. We're doing a dry run today of a show that Damien and I are going to try to bring to you guys once a week. Yep. Unless Damien's in Tahiti. And then it'll be a Tahiti-based type of thing. Yeah. You know, uh, Damien, just you know, while we're getting Instagram and stuff up and going, Damien and I have a recurring call every week. And we're just always challenging each other. And our conversations are always so great. We're like, we should share this with the world because it's just cool. Or at least we think it's cool. We, if we have a, a, a join and then an opt out, like immediately within 15 seconds, we'll know how cool we are. Exactly. Well, and actually they can give us live feed, feedback uh, through the comments section. So right. um, they're, that's one way. It's one way to tell us that they're either enjoying or not. I like that. Yeah. So we should be uh, going Instagram live here too, if you want to just watch for that little pop up. Okay. And then we can get out to the Instagram world. Okay. You should have that, Mr. Damien. So this is the MD show, Doctorizing Money. And one of the things that uh, Damien and I are going to try to do is determine what the heck does doctorizing money, finance, and investing actually mean. That's part of the process. I mean, that, that's something that I think everybody needs to figure out. And so it's an exploration for us. And it's an exploration for, for everybody else. I think we were, you know, the, this idea that discussions around money and, well, I mean, most discussions are not really honest anymore. They're, they're really jaded and they're, and there's, there's a way to approach things like a logical, thoughtful, considerate place where, in, where you have civil discourse and mm -hmm. where you can converse uh, with different ideas. And so you and I have had those ideas, those conversations but we don't really see them in public all that much. We just see people on fringe sides, not really communicating, just kind of blasting for, with a horn. And I think that there's an, an opportunity for, for people to learn something different and for us to learn and, and explore things like what's going on in money and occasionally some other stuff that is really impacting people. You know, I was talking about this a couple of weeks ago in a podcast that I did. And, and um, you know, I, I think a lot of people really just look at one of our, uh, the guys that we both love is George Gammon. And he's always talking about macroeconomics. And I think one of the issues nowadays, and this was the podcast that I put out, I think so many people are focused on the microeconomic, you know, how does this affect me? How does it affect my personal finance, even, you know, locally, my business finance, whatever, but really we need to be thinking in terms of macro. And I think that's one of the things that you'll see us probably have a lot of conversation about because a lot of people just have their head in the sand and don't really see what's going on in the world. And it does directly affect us when you're not paying attention to it, it's a, it's a problem. Well, a lot of the things that like our, our friend, Chris Martinson will talks about the, the effect of exponential growth. He talks about how, if you have something doubling, then you don't really notice the impact until right at the last second. It's like, if you, if you take a, a, a drop of water and you put it in a stadium and then you double it and there's another drop and you sit there and and, and every minute you double that, that drop, it's interesting because about three minutes before you drown, even if you're at the top of the, the stadium, nothing really looked like it was life-threatening, meaning that it's it's like 3% full a few minutes before you die. And and the, the point of that is that our brains aren't really set up to think exponentially. We're, we're meant to, to we're, we, we think linearly. And because we're in this exponential shifting time, uh, we're going to get run over. Most people are going to get run over by things like the monetary system is changing. The, the idea of interest rates and, and government stimulus and all these things that you and I talk about all the time trying to figure it out, and George Gammon does a great job with that, they're, they're confusing, and most people just shut down. We, mm -hmm. we, we stop because we have no idea where to start. So I think part of our job is, is to explore and start pulling these things apart and seeing what we can figure out and how we can put these puzzle pieces together. Yeah. I think it's such a great point that you make too because I think so many people – even if they get a glimpse or they have some kind of idea or an understanding of what's going on, it's so overwhelming because people are like, okay, well, how, what do I do about this? And, and really, I think it's, you, you just need to start taking the next right step, right? You don't have to, you don't have to try to solve everything at once, but if you're paralyzed with fear and you don't start moving toward it and at least trying to understand it, you're never, you're going to find, you're going to wake up 10 years from now, 20 years from now and find yourself completely left behind. And there's all this discussion about, you know, the middle class being wiped out and the wealthy and then the poor and there being no middle class anymore. If we're not careful and we're not paying attention and we're not trying to just, again, do the next right thing, 
um, we can't get overwhelmed and paralyzed by fear. And I love that point that you made because we just got to start moving toward the goalpost. And the more that we can, you know, make that next right move, the closer we get to it. Yeah. And a lot of these things are, they're minor moves to it, but ahead of the macro movement. Mm -hmm. And so you start, it's, it's like the, it's like how we got to the moon or how you move a, a, an aircraft carrier. It's, it's, you, you use a trim tab. It's that little piece on a boat that just moves the, the rudder and it's these little micro movements. It's kind of like the idea of improving 1% a day. Mm -hmm. Anybody can do that. Most people don't consistently. They do it one time and, and then they go for 5% improvement. They break themselves and they can't feel their leg for a week or, or they do some big leap into money, investing something, and then they get whacked and they go, I'm out. I hurt too bad. And instead, if we do these, these, these incremental movements of growth, personal development, growth, monetary understanding, and we, we realize this is a process. Like, I, how many times have, have you had conversations with people where they say, I, have, I, I want to do something, but I have no idea where to start. And they try to consume the entire elephant over lunch. And it's, it's like too much. And then they want to take action and they do too much. And, and we just, we have to allow the expansion, the stretching. If you, I guess the way to look at it is, is thinking about if you stretch something, you can stretch it and over time it'll reform just like a tree. Well, you can bend it slightly, slightly, slightly. And over time it'll become curved. If you try to do that all at once, one day it breaks in half. And that's how we are. We're, we're malleable, but we, I think people are putting too much pressure trying to do everything overnight because everything is instant. Everything is like immediate anymore. It makes so much sense. And I'm thinking, even as you're saying that, like so many people, I think, um, have a feeling of hopelessness. And that's one of the things about, you know, just showing up and learning and making those little course corrections. I'm actually thinking of a scripture in the Bible. I just love the parallel to some of the stories. And uh, there's a scripture in Proverbs that says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And when people are so overwhelmed by the big picture and they don't know what to do next and where to move, they literally just lose their hope. And so that's one of the things that, you know, I think hopefully we can accomplish showing up every week is is kind of try to demystify some of this and what's the next right move and what's the next best thing. And just even if, you know, one person gets one great idea that helps set them on that trajectory to freedom or whatever it is that they're looking for, that's a win in my book. Yeah, that 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 is, and I think that's the, the best possible outcome for, for everybody, for you guys watching. Think as you're listening, as you're watching, think about, hey, there's, I just picked one thing up and then run with that one thing. Don't take 50 things that you need to do this week or this day. I think that that's, that's where you go, okay. And then you end up with the shelf help book where it's just pull up full of ideas sitting there and nothing happens. And instead grab that one thing and do something. That's the biggest missing piece in seminars, webinars. People go, oh my gosh, these are great. And then they go to the next dopamine hit and then they never really take the action. And that's where the growth happens. Like you can look at the gym and it's amazing. But if you don't go in there and lift that thing, uh, the, the, there's nothing about money or finance or financial freedom that is impossible. What's impossible is doing it in one day. And mm -hmm. that's, I think that that's the, the biggest takeaway. And, if, and maybe it's, we, we mentioned a book and you go, okay, cool. Okay. So go read one page out of that book. Like anybody can, like the idea behind freedom and progress is progressing through it. It's something. And it's, People go, how did how did you get where you are? You know, people ask, they ask you, they ask me, how did you get there? And you made a comment, I think it was on on uh, one of your on Instagram recently. Somebody said, well, how did you start? And you said, I started, I mm. did something, and that's and that's what it is. Like you and I didn't start off in a place where we can talk about monetary policy and talk about investing and cap rates and and risk profiles and sensitivity analysis. Like all that stuff is just it's a, a regular language for us now. But in the beginning. I couldn't spell mortgage. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time I heard, I think it was Kiyosaki say mortgage came from the Latin word mortier until death. And I was like, oh my God. And so like, you know, you, you learn these things and, and eventually it just becomes, you're like, okay, I get it. It's, it's meant to keep me in shackles and enslaved forever. So how do I beat that system? Yeah. You know, I love what you were talking about earlier about just the compound effect that, that Chris Martinson talked about, about just the one drip and having that, you know, that doubling effect. And it's, it's so it's so valuable in the sense of what you're talking about. I, I found myself lately having this conversation with a lot of people. I think people are looking for home runs. And yeah. the reality is, is base hits, base hits, base hits. You look at, you look at the most successful people in the world. And you know, there's that old phrase that I'm an overnight success, 20 years in the making. I think that's really the theme that's like kind of popping up here for us right now. You just got to get moving. And you know, I, I said this a while back until the pain of your current situation becomes stronger or more unbearable than the pain that it's going to take to get there. You're not going to do anything about it. And I love what you just said about the shelf help book, because the reality is so many people, 
are doing their thing and they're moving through life and they know what they need to do. They're just not doing it. And it's just those little steps. It's that next right thing. Well, and, and I, I love that because when, when you look around and, and you see people that are smart, like people think that the key to freedom is, is being smart. They think the key to, to not having to worry about money is being smart. And if that was true, then all the PhDs in the world would be the wealthiest people. And that's, that's not who's the, the wealthiest people. I mean, it's, it's kind of funny that the Federal Reserve has, what, 900 PhDs, and they're definitely not the wealthiest people. They, they manipulate all the money, but that's another story. It's, it's, not, it's not about being smart. It's about being dumb enough to take action with incomplete information. And that's the thing. People are so afraid of making a mistake. And guess what? It generally doesn't kill you. Like, I always make this joke that growing up in Alaska, I, I could have made a mistake and been eaten because I had to dodge polar bears. Like, that was a thing. If, if I didn't you know, if I was thinking about something else, then when I took the trash out in the Arctic Circle, I could be eaten. Unless you're in Africa or Alaska, like that's just not going to happen. And yet we act as if making a mistake is going to kill us. And so what do we do? We don't. And, that, and then there's no progress. And then we go on this merry-go-round and then we go, oh, a decade just went by and, and it's the same life. And then we get frustrated and we go, what happened? Well, nothing. And that's, and that's because we're programmed to avoid mistakes because of the judgment. And I think that that's the single biggest spiritual killer that's mm -hmm. out there is this this idea that mistakes are somehow bad in fact they're the opposite they're the best thing you can do yeah i'm reading that book right now called the subtle art of not giving a fuck have you read that i love mark manson's book i mean it's you have to get to that place at one of my mentors years ago said you have no idea how much power and freedom you'll have until you literally don't give a shit what anybody else thinks the moment you stop caring what other people think you are free and i went Oh, and then of course, Mark's book came, comes out. I'm like, oh, that maybe he met Dan. Okay. I mean, it, but it's true. You have to let go of that judgment or the association of what most people aren't thinking about you anyway. They're thinking about their own stuff. And, and yet we get wound up. What are they thinking about me? You trip, you ever tripped like on the sidewalk, you trip and you look around. Like, did somebody just see me? Yeah. And maybe they, they probably, and they laughed and then they're getting back to their life because you were funny. And maybe they'll even tell somebody, man, this guy ran into a, a sign yeah. and it's, you know, it's funny, but, and, and then what? Like, I think you have to laugh at those things in the middle of them, even if you're bleeding. Yeah. You know, when you were talking about getting eaten by a polar bear or whatever your example was, like it's such a, it's actually such a great, you know, tie into this because when you look back at, you know, our DNA and just our years and years and years of genetic programming and the makeup of who we are, I mean, the, the whole flight or, uh, fight or flight mechanism, I mean, everything in us is, is a protection mechanism and we really don't have that much to worry about today but our caveman brain is always thinking of those worst case scenarios as you're talking about. We have to be cognizant of that too, because if we could just flip that switch, like you're saying, the most spiritual part of all of this, like is being able to use that from a creation standpoint, a growth standpoint, you know, moving yourself forward in life versus always looking at the fear or what's somebody thinking, or I love that you said that nobody's even thinking about you. Like we spend so much time worrying about that. Nobody cares. No, no, no. Honestly, nobody cares. We think they care. And so we on social, we're like trying to have this perfect thing. And, and then we want to have the perfect shot. I was, I was out having a Valentine's date with myself, which is, I don't know if that's embarrassing or what, the, anyway, it is what it is. And I was there and, and there's this girl sitting at the bar next to me. And, and I, I was like, wow, she is dressed to the nines, said, man. Somebody's lucky that they're going to, she's going to be their date. And then I, I was there and then she's one of her friends shows up and, and they end up going outside. I see him in this lobby area. And they're taking pictures and she's doing all these pictures and all these profiles. And I was like, okay, so you're literally dressed up to go nowhere mm. so that you can put yourself out. And it was just an interesting thing to watch all this stuff. And, and, and when you, when you disconnect from that and you say, this is my life, I'm going to live it. I'm going to do my thing. And, and you, it, it takes, it takes an internal trust in you being good enough. And it, and this release towards the, the, biological programming that you mentioned we are programmed to watch the rustle in the bushes and and to be fair we want people to look at us and to we want to fit in because at a tribal level that's how we stay alive mm -hmm. I mean, for millions of years how did we stay alive by blending in because if you stick out you get eaten i mean we're back to being eaten but that's what happens with all animals including humans we'll get taken out because tribes protect us and so you have to you have to think about why are these things happening and, and do they serve me and, and maybe it's time to go find a new tribe because your tribe will protect you. It'll protect you and keep you in place. And that's the problem for most people is their tribe is not helping them progress. It's helping them stay stagnant. Yeah. You know, and you brought up such a valuable, I think, 
conversation point, you know, I've been saying this for a while. There's nothing wrong with social media. The issue with social media is that people go there to consume. And I love that you kind of just started, you know, I guess segmenting that because the reality is the people that are using social media properly are creators. And the people that are using business properly are creators, entrepreneurs are creators, investors are creators. The problem is, and just bringing this into a financial like perspective, there's consumption and there's creation. So you can either, you know, play into the consumption world and fall into that trap, or you can become a creator. And so all of these tools exist and they can be good or bad. One thing that I want to say before we, you know, jump off of this, I love what you said about the federal reserve and the PhDs. They have more PhDs than anywhere in the world. And here's the thing at the MD show, neither one of us have a PhD, but, but we're pretty smart. I'm just, that's self-proclaimed. It, that, you know what it is? It's just more blood. Like we've been out there and, and the, the, the whole idea of academics, I, this is, I, I heard this from Kiyosaki years ago, but PhD stands for poor, helpless and, or, or poor, was it poor, helpless and, uh, desperate. Oh yeah. Something like that. And, and, and you, know, you and I have just gone out there and bled literally fig figuratively, physically have bled. And I, again, like I was, I was moving some stuff in the garage this last weekend and I ran into my table saw and I looked down and I had this, like this thing that went across my hand and I was like, Oh, that was dumb. And I, and then all of a sudden I'm bleeding and I looked down and there's blood all over my pants. And I'm, I was like, okay, you know, like I got cut. I, I was bleeding in the garage and, and we, we have those experiences and, and for us to be afraid of those things, we have immune systems, we have tools, we have these things, we have people, you know, we have 911, like we have these things that are out there and yet we're trying to never bleed. Mm. That's it. I, you know, it's, it's really, it makes me sad to see. And I love how you and, and Kara, you're, you're the opposite with your kids. The, this idea that kids are the parents job with our kids is to protect them from ever having any pain. This whole, mm. we're creating this nation of snowflakes. And I look at that and I go, that's the opposite. And then my sister, of course, says, well, you don't have any kids you don't know. And I'm like, I do know. It's instinctual that mm -hmm. a job of an adult with a child is to prepare them to be independent and get the heck out of the nest alive and be able to survive in the wild. That's the same thing that's been going on for a million years. Yeah. It's not new. But yeah. yet somehow we're supposed to keep everybody safe and in this bubble. And, and you can see a reflection. We've got a lot of people that are afraid. And that's, that's not how you – like you, you mentioned – consuming there's an interesting thing like this dialogue what's happening i'm contributing something you're consuming it you contribute something i'm consuming it there's a circulation so most people are really good at either consuming mm -hmm. or or contributing yeah most people it's consuming unfortunately you have to be good at both and when you have a balance of those you end up being in circulation which is a very very fruitful natural um, life sustaining uh, process i love it and it's such a give and take too and that's the thing that I mean, even just with the consumption process, some people don't, they don't want to do that hard work. They don't want to show up. They don't want to contribute. They just want to take from the conversation. And I love the way you said that too, as you were saying it, I visually see that because when you have people that are, I guess, kind of like working together, contribute, consume, contribute, consume, it really escalates the conversation. There's so much, there's another side to this. Everybody's in this day and age that we're in right now, there's so much hate and arguments and all that kind of stuff. And I think you and I talked about this, but maybe we, I didn't mention this, but over Christmas break, um, I, I was a couple of glasses of wine in and the kids, you know, we were, we, we always just hang out and have fun and play games. And one of the kids was like talking about debate for some reason, debate in school. And we, we set up a debate at our house and we're like, okay, so we broke up into teams and it was me against Kara and Tim against Kate and then Dylan against Hannah. And the, the four that weren't debating had to leave the room and come up with a debate for the two. So like Karen, and I had to debate each other and the kids made me, so I had to argue why we should take money from the wealth and give it to the poor. And what, you know, I remember Tim saying afterwards, he's like, man, you really know your enemy. <laughs> and the way that he said that was like, <laughs> it isn't my enemy per se, but I loved the, you know, just kind of like the correlation because when I had to argue a viewpoint that was opposite of what I, I don't believe that we should take money from the wealthy and give it to the poor because the wealthy are just going to have it back because it's they've they've doctorized money they understand finance and investing so i don't believe that but putting myself in the other on the other side of the aisle it's not it's not a bad thing but in this day and age when people want to argue they just want to argue to argue and it's not a healthy conversation we should be able to have healthy debates and try to solve problems and 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 
it, this goes back to the primal stuff because I mean, it's it's a perfect lead into thinking why does this happen and and how if, if you understand why something's happening you, you're more likely able to do something about it if you don't understand why you get stuck in the trap and and when you think about watching whether it's it's a news channel doesn't matter you you pick your poison but you watch a news channel they're meant to keep you attracted to them based on primarily fear and finding a place where you can be part of a tribe because if you agree with them then good you're part of the place that you should be the problem is they're not actually having a conversation they're just having an indoctrination and mm -hmm. that's that's what we have we have indoctrinating prophets or or you know mouthpieces instead of conversations instead of places where we can learn and grow and and challenge the narrative and i remember there was a uh, it was a I forget whose show it was, but there was a guy who was a hardcore socialist and, and he was on, he was on, it may have been George Gammon shows. It was on somebody's show. And I remember listening to him and I was like, I'm really curious. Like, I want to know what a hardcore socialist and my God, Mike, he made sense. I was like, this guy really, he's got me thinking socialism is a good thing. And, and there were key points that when I thought about it later, they were manipulated. And yet, there were still it was it was a it was really healthy for me to understand that from his perspective because this is a guy who's very smart, very thoughtful. And I came away from that thinking and mentioning it. And then I remember some other people, and in fact, I think I think we even talked this may have been in 2020. I think there was somebody that uh, we know that that said, Yeah, that guy is an idiot. And it was it was the the conservative capitalistic approach, which I'm a fan of. That's me, but there was no room to understand a lot of other people. And part of this is, I think a lot of philosophies that are flawed are based on fear. They're based on pain. And so people will go into them. It's, it's why you have things like, like Hitler rising up. You have people are in pain. And so they stop thinking they're just afraid and they're, they're trying to survive. And, and that's where a lot of people are. And I think it's going to get worse. So our job, I think our job is to, like you said, give people hope, give them ideas, give them tools and give them an action, something that they can do to start taking or control away from these these systems and and put it in their own hands. Yeah, I love just even circling back to what you said a few minutes ago. I think there's this idea that, you know, even talking about the news channel and all of that, I think there's this idea that maybe there's not enough to go around. And I just don't believe that from an abundance perspective. It, it's almost back to the same thing, like taking from this group to give it to this group. When you really think about it, if you just shift the narrative a little bit, there's so much information and knowledge and experience that isn't shared with the, the public at large. And, and that's not completely fair either, because in this day and age, you can get any amount of information you want. So the reality is if you just figure out who to go listen to, but even you alone, and I think we should dive into this, um, the ability to, to pull your retirement out of the traditional you know, markets and finance and then go you know, invest it in other avenues. Nobody talks about that. I can't tell you how many times since I've met you and we've really started talking about this, that, you know, people have no idea that they have other options than just the wall street 401k where, you know, all these big wealth advisors and stuff are making the money. Nobody's, nobody's talking about that as a side note real quick. Um, we need to get a Jamie like Joe Rogan has, Hey Jamie, look this up. But that episode you were talking about was called Marxism deep dive um, with Richard Wolf on the George yeah. Gilman show. Yeah. And that was so good. You and I spent a lot of time talking about that because it was one of those episodes where I literally remember what I was doing and where I was at because it was so impactful. And, and it really like, to your point, I was like, I think I might be a communist. <laughs> like it was so convincing. <laughs> so, but anyway, I, it's just, you know, there's so much information out there, but I feel like, I feel like you have to work really hard to get the right information. You, well, you, you do, and and, you, and and here's here's the reality. What you said a second ago, it's it's so true that there is all the information. It's unlimited information. It's a mess of information. And so, how do you sift it? How do you sort it? You you find you find people that you resonate with, and and it starts with trust. And that's that's the first thing because all the information is out there. What what's hard? Like I love this saying that we're we're drowning in information and we're starving for wisdom. Mm -hmm. We we truly are. And so one, one of the first things that I always like to do is if I'm listening to somebody, my question is, what are you doing? Not just what are you saying? Like I want to understand, in a, in a, like with investing, with, with money, I want to understand if the person that's giving me advice is actually broke because that's how a lot of people that 
provide advice are. Mm -hmm. They're they're paid. They don't make money investing. They make, they make money selling the packaged investments. That's how our system is set up. And so challenging, like, and quite frankly, mo a lot of people that are wealthy aren't spending time trying to sell their advice. They're they're spending their time creating wealth, building mm -hmm. companies, investing. So you have to start digging a little deeper. It's easy to. I mean, it. I years ago I remember hearing this: if you can't do it, then teach it. And that's it's been it's been this thing. It's it's easy to teach, and and you can use marketing, and and that's it's one of the things I love about you. You're you're out there doing things, teaching, and it's based on your life. It's not just based on some book you read. And you're like, oh, I'm going to be a master. I spent a weekend reading this book, and that's how a lot of the teaching is out there. It's not it's no different than college professors teaching economics and business. Yeah, most of them have never done any business or economics other than the theory that they read from Marx and Keynes. You know, I don't remember who the real estate teacher was that said this, and he was uh, a very successful real estate investor, but um, he said, I made millions off of investing in real estate and I made hundreds of millions off teaching real estate investing. And I just thought that was such an interesting like correlation because at the end of the day, like you said, there's so many people, I love what Kiyosaki says that, you know, they're called brokers because they're broker than you. Um, and really, you know, there's nobody, the way that he really outlined my, my brain immediately comes back to the cash flow quadrant because, you know, on the left side of that, the employee, and there's nothing wrong with being an employee or being self-employed, but at the same time, like really the wealth is made when we start think you were talking about wealthy people, they're not spending all their time thinking about, you know, uh, they're, they're just out making money. They're just doing what they do. Right. And it's such a, it's such an interesting correlation because, uh, the way Kiyosaki said it, it's such a visual moving over to that business side of the quadrant or the investing side of the quadrant is so important. And there's nothing wrong with being an employee. There's nothing wrong with being self-employed, but at the same time, if we're just trading our time for dollars, you know, just thinking about like, if you have to look at something and say, okay, that's $15. I have to work an hour to pay for that. Like that's a mindset that we've got to, we've got to kind of shift. We, we, there, there has to be a linear, a, a break in the linear thinking and, and this idea that we're workhorses and that's, it's a very industrial age idea that it's about factories and farms. Like you traded time for production of, of corn or making a tool and it's been hardwired into us. And then basically this is how it works. And it, and so we, we've been doing that we for forever. And, and th there are people that we look out and unfortunately they're, they're being demonized like, Oh, look at that person with that fancy stuff and the big cars and the big house and all that time. And they look like they're so happy. They all the, honestly, most of those people, what they did is they started to understand the, the difference between trading time for money and trading money for time. And when we, when you take money and you buy an asset, you're trading money for time. Wealthy people trade money for time. They have a confidence in doing that. Whereas a weak, poor person, and we all start there. We don't start off as Hercules. A weak, yeah. poor person will always trade money or would trade time for money because it's like, it's like a crackhead. Oh, look, I can, I can provide my time, get this dollar and then go spend it on something. And it's always like this hand to mouth. The, we, we've been trained and then. You know, this you, you mentioned retirement and and we get trained to do this thing until we're basically out of energy and then we die. Yeah. That's that's how our system has been set up for a hundred years. Yeah. In all areas too. Like if you look at anything that wealthy, successful people have done, it's always leverage. It's leveraging somebody else's time, it's using somebody else's money. And but it's like you said, it's demonized. Don't go into debt, you know, trade your time for money, be a good employee, go to school, get a job, put your money into a 401k. And don't worry, it'll still be there 60 years later. It's the exact opposite of what wealthy people do. And it's crazy because we've, we've, I, I almost feel, I almost feel sad. And this is why I think we even want to do the MD show, like doctorizing money, because the reality is like, th it's these little switches that, that changed our whole world. And we've just been programmed. I love what you said. And, and I, I'd like to circle back to this. Um, you said this early on, and then you kind of alluded to it a few minutes ago. We're, we're liking this. The industrial age idea is an outdated idea. We're in a, I think it was Ralph Powell, right? That said, or Ralph Paul that said, we're in the exponential age and it's a different way of thinking. And I was just having this conversation with Tim the other day, Tony Robbins made this comment and I think it was a Cambridge study or something that said by 2040, 50% of the jobs that exist today will no longer be in existence. And so we're in this period of time where we have to be, 
we have to move and make changes and not be married to old ideas faster than ever. And when you brought that up about the industrial age being an industrial age idea, um, it's so true. We're in a whole different age and, and technology and all this is, is changing things so fast. We don't have time to sit on our thumbs. We, we don't. We, we, if you think about things that have happened over the last hundred years, that the dollar has lost 97% of its purchasing power. An ounce of gold was $20 a hundred years ago, and now it's 2000. Basically, you look at that, that type of change because of exponential processing with microchips and, and that, we're, we're looking at those type of changes over 20 years, not a hundred years where there's a 97% change in something and, and the speed. And, and so like we, I'm one of the conversations you and I've had over the last couple of years that's come up and it's coming up more and more is this idea of, of universal basic income. And that is something we saw a test of it in 2020, where basically government federal reserve, central banks were just printing money and giving it to people. And it was like this giant test cloaked in a pandemic. And, and so regardless of the rationale or anything else, it did happen. And as technology is changing with, with robotics and AI and 3D printing and all these things that Peter Diamandis talks about a lot, the, the, that is going to lead to a place where people are saying, what do I do? What's, what's my role? Because a lot of the things from truck drivers to, uh, to even programmers, I mean, you have code, Mike, now that codes itself and that's getting smarter and smarter and AI is becoming aware, I mean, for better or worse, so then you, you have to get ahead of this curve because if you're waiting and you're like, okay, well, I'm a truck driver and I'm making $80,000 a year, it's going to be literally overnight. And all of a sudden you're going to be not retooled unto You're going to be outdated and gone. And you're going to have electric autonomous trucks that are safer, smarter, 24 hours a day, zero accidents. Like that stuff's going to happen. And then you're going to say, what do I do? And what most people are going to do is they're going to run for help from somebody and, and they're going to put people in power. We've got to do better than that. And we can we have to take that 1% step today and start retooling ourselves before we get run over by that electric semi. Yeah. And keeping our minds open, like that we have got to remain open to what's changing. Do you know what the most Googled word of 2021 was? was NFT. Really? Yeah. Um, I just heard this the other day. I think it was on the Gary V show. I didn't verify that by the way, but um, it's a fake news, Mike. Yeah, totally. It probably is. But, but if you think about that, even if it's not true that it was the most Googled word, how many times did you hear the word? Just think about it. What, I mean, what have you heard just, you know, the last two months, what have you heard more of than anything else? Um, besides real estate crash or interest rates, rising NFTs. And if you just think about that, I don't care what you think about an NFT in general. I hear so many people that are like, what is it? What, what does it do? How does it, oh, that's crazy. Like why would people just, it doesn't matter why it's happening and you've got to, you've got to remain open. This was the whole point of me saying that you have to remain open to what's going on around us. Because again, from a macro perspective, it doesn't matter what I think about it. What matters is what's going to happen. And I don't control that outcome. I'm just one little, I'm just one little part of this massive universe. And it doesn't matter what I believe about what's going on out there. What matters is what's really happening. Well, and, and, and when you look around, you can, it's, it's really interesting to see the, what people think is happening in, in terms of mainstream media or, or the official narrative and, and what's actually happening when you, when you start digging. And so like the, the crypto space and the, the NFTs that this started off with Bitcoin uh, more than 10 years ago, and we're, we're watching so much energy and energy. So money is energy and we're watching hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars being pushed into funds and development and startups. And, and it's, it's happening because the, sh the system is changing. And what's really interesting is that the centralized controlled systems are, are trying to figure out how to remain relevant. And so they're, they're doing all sorts of things. They're trying to get in the game with like central bank, digital currency. They're trying to regulate. They're just running scared because the innovation is happening faster and it's decentralized all over the, the world. So that's why you see, you, we saw recently, the, the administration going and tr trying to do this treaty with all these countries because Ireland for many years was a, a place where like Apple could go and, and have a great tax rate like none or 10% or something. And, and that didn't really work because all this money was offshore. Well, mm -hmm. money is, is just, it's ether. It's like air, it's, you know, it's energy. And, and so they're, they're trying to maintain control. It's almost comical to me because how do you maintain control of the entire planet? Like good luck with a decentralized system. So like you said, 
it doesn't matter if you like it or not, it is happening. And, and like NFTs are a precursor to a, a, a more efficient system where it's honest. Our system has been very corrupted forever because you have centralized power places where you have to trust somebody and you have to do all these different things. You have to have accountants and attorneys and you have to have title companies and that stuff just goes away. And it starts off with like these freaking apes, these bored apes. And people are like, oh, that's what NFTs are, bored apes. And Justin Bieber paid $1.2 million. And that that's, you're missing the point. I think most people are missing the fact that we're shifting into a digital exponential age that changes everything. I mean, look at, look at what's happening with, with the metaverse and, and this idea that you don't ever leave. You just stay in your house with a mask behind a camera and or Oculus or whatever. like things are changing and it doesn't matter if you like it or not. You can be a Luddite, which basically means you want to go burn it down. Yeah. Or you can say, well, how, how is this, how, how might I be able to fit into this and thrive? Yeah. Well, it's inter- like, seriously, my favorite commercial on the Super Bowl was Coinbase's QR code. And, and it's interesting because immediately I was sitting next to Dylan, my, my oldest son's girlfriend. And immediately she looks and she jumps up and she grabs her phone. We're being like programmed we, we knew what to do. And, and I think Coinbase was so brilliant other than the fact that I heard it cr- crash their website. I don't know if that's true or not either. But when we think about that, just even back to the apes and the NFTs, I heard, um, actually it was uh, Chris Harder sent me a, a link to a restaurant that Gary Vee launched or invested in or something in New York. And in order to go to the restaurant, you have to, you, you got to pay a membership just like a country club or whatever but it's in the version of an NFT. And I loved what you just, the parallel you made a minute ago, because so, so many things are manipulated. Like you're, you're a gold and silver guy from, from way back. Right. Um, do you want to plug for your gold and silver company? No, <laughs> <laughs> just an age old pirate that started before gold was even legal. I mean, totally. When you look at that though, and you talk about how manipulated those markets and even the price and the valuation, like nobody actually knows what the value of gold is and everything else. Cause it's a, but when you, when you flip it, like to the way that this restaurant works, if you want to be able to go and eat at this restaurant, you have to be a member. The only way to get the, a membership is to have an NFT. And so on a, from a supply and demand perspective, whether it's membership to that restaurant or whether it's owning a piece of land in the metaverse, or, you know, eventually, um, I think, I, I think, you know, uh, cryptocurrency and real estate, like pure title, all of that, it's, it's just pure. It's like nobody can nobody can manipulate this. And that's the thing that people are missing if they think it's just Justin Bieber buying an ape. It doesn't really matter because the reality is like, if you think about it in its simplest form, what makes a painting valuable? So even if it is just an ape and there's only a hundred of them and people want them, it's supply and demand. But the reality is there's so much more utilization in it than just this, you know, ape 3d image there it actually represents something as well and i think people don't understand that yet well and and here's one of the coolest things about this whole deal it's so early in what's going on there isn't a single person on the planet and i say that truly because i don't care i mean i've been in in some pretty crazy places in asia and africa where actually people were really happy and there was like no electricity but the the point is that you've got if any more, if you can get a cell phone, which just about anybody, unless you're in prison, you can probably get a cell phone. Still, you you have access to being a part of this conversation and a part of what's going on. And because we're taking the 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 controls off of a lot of things, where you know what, I want to buy a condo in in the Maldives. Well, I can buy five dollars worth of that or or one satoshi worth of that condo because it's going to be it's going to be put on the blockchain and people can trade that it becomes a totally fluid market without manipulation from from dick grasso at the new york stock exchange or who, whoever else is going to manipulate it jamie diamond at chase can't screw up the silver market if it's on the blockchain if there's actual assets tied to the blockchain like all of a sudden these power players that have been lining their pockets and getting wealthy at the expense of other people are going to become irrelevant and that's so to me, that's a great thing for us to focus on. Instead of saying, well, somebody's wealthy, that's bad. H- how do we create wealth in, a, in, a, in an honest way? And part of that is, like I love the way that Ron Paul would always talk about how, how you end war. It's by honest commerce. Because when, when countries are trading with each other, they generally are not going to war with each other. And that's the same thing with people. When we're trading, when we're working together, we, we tend to not be in a hostile environment because we're relying on each other in an honest way. Not, not, a, not a, like I, I need you or I'm going to die. 
but honestly, this is a good exchange for both of us. And and you take all of the friction and all of the uh, all the manipulation away using the blockchain because it's transparent, and that is something that's been missing forever. The transparency. I love it. What do you think? Um, let's talk about the retirement world for a second. We had a big, crazy issue today. I love I love what you do in your business because literally you help people take control of their retirement. But talk to me about what you said happened this morning. So it was, it was kind of crazy. I was watching some stuff in the crypto space and 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 it, breaking news that IRA Financial just had. So this is a an IRA company that has been around for a long time. The, the founder um, is an attorney, has written eight books and you know fairly well-known and well-respected and they got hacked. So people had said, oh, I wanna have some crypto in my IRA. Well, $34 million worth of crypto got hacked and stolen and it's gone. And there's there's no way that that Adam has $34 million to just fix it. It's It, it was hacked and gone and it's, so you start thinking about this, is this a good system where I don't have control of my assets and IRAs, you don't have control and you literally legally can't have control and command where you can like hold them because the courts actually said, no, you can't last November. They, there was, an, there was a, a ruling that made that illegal. So in a, in a situation like this, you have to start asking, what are the options? And there are ways to control your assets, just like if you want to buy gold, you can buy gold and physically hold it and there's no counterparty risk, or you can go and you can buy an ETF, which is totally manipulated. And that's what all the wall street crowds want to sell you because they can make their fees and commissions. And then you don't really control anything. In fact, you don't even really, you don't even really own anything. So th what, what this was, this was a really good example of, of counterparty risk and, and that IRAs are not really you in control of your future because there is no protection. Those people that lost that money, one, that company will probably be shut down by some agency because they're a trust company holding custody of assets. And, and that's a lot of places have that type of risk. And, and the, the hacking and all this that's going on by, I mean, there are massive operations in China and Russia for hackers right now. Their, and their goal is to attack places and vulnerabilities. And why wouldn't you go after an IRA custodian that seems like a really good idea. If you're a hacker somewhere, you're like, oh, good. You know what? There's probably hundreds of millions of dollars floating around in there that we can go grab, and then it's gone. So the, the, what I saw there was that a lot of people are going blindly into a space and trusting. And, and for uh, there's a lot of IRA companies that really don't have the technical sophistication. In fact, I couldn't name one that is technically savvy that I would trust having assets sitting on their balance sheet. They're, I, I doubt any of them have had white hat hackers going in to try to blow apart their vulnerabilities like like the chases of the world they've had white hat hackers they'll go in and try to find their their exposures but these ira companies i'm just i'm nervous for a lot of people because there's 10 trillion dollars in iras like mm. 10 trillion dollars worth of assets in those things you know what's interesting i was having this conversation and i'm curious to get your viewpoint on this i was talking to somebody the other day um that was talking about how they don't trust um coinbase um and you know, good, good, bad, or indifferent, you know, talking about, uh, taking, taking their, their Bitcoin and, and putting it into a, a crypto wallet that they own and control. But I just thought it was interesting that we're so skeptical when it comes to like this new, uh, you know, Bitcoin Coinbase, all of this, but yet we're comfortable with banks or E-Trade or any other, um, you know, technology that has our money digits in it. It's just, it's interesting to me. Well, and here, here's what should terrify everybody. And it's it's good to be terrified at times because it'll help you take action because we'll tend to, if it's either painful or fearful, we'll take action way faster than if it just sounds like it would feel good or it tastes good. So like how fast you spit something out when it's rotten versus, you, you know, you're like, oh, that's tasty. And you you're like, you don't choke eating the really tasty stuff, but you will spit it out fast when it's, it's, it's painful. Uh, we... I got all wrapped up in food for a second. I was thinking, you know, I was thinking about the, 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 the banks and, and, and that system. We don't think about that stuff. It's just like, it's a foregone conclusion that our assets, our cash is, is safe inside these systems. And, and, oh, I know what I was going to say. There are these, these things that are happening around the world right now where places like in Turkey or Cyprus, they're, they're, they're literally, uh, 
they're pulling assets out of banks and saying, we're going to recapitalize the bank. And if you look at the, the actual microprint in banks, there are, there are options for banks to say, okay, we're taking your money to become, we're going to give you equity in the bank. We're going to basically take, we don't think about these things because for most of us, it's not happened. And for most of these unbelievably unlikely scenarios, they'll never happen until they happen to us. Yep. And, and it's, so we have to start thinking about these things and being rational that they do happen. They happen all the time. And just because they haven't happened to us doesn't mean they're not happening. So I, I like, I like the, the book thinking for a change. And, and I, I did a program a couple of years ago on that early in the pandemic. And it was, it was about the thinking like optimistic thinking versus pessimistic thinking. And in the early days, I was Mr. Optimistic, man, that everything was blue skies and unicorns and puppy dogs. And it was, it was great until I had my ass handed to me and lost $25 million. And I was like, oh, perhaps I should have some other types of thinking because there is like, you can stand in front of a train and be optimistic that you're not going to be run over and you're still dead. So there's pragmatic thinking. I should move about eight feet over this way and that would be smart. So thinking through these things, I don't think it, it means being a Pollyanna. It doesn't mean being a pessimist. We know plenty of people that are just saying the world is going to end and it's always that way. And and yet you have people like Peter Diamandis who talks about the exponential changes and Raul Paul and, and all these amazing things that are coming. So we have to be able to think like simultaneously with different types of, of heads. Yeah. Otherwise we're going to get way off in one direction and we're going to miss out on all the other stuff that's actually happening at the same time. Yeah. Well, even just thinking about the, and I, I love how you just talked to you know, our perspective is everything. So when, when that study came out and Tony Robbins was talking about how by 2040, 50% of the jobs that exist today are not going to exist. Uh, Tim and my, uh, Tim and I, my middle son, we were having a conversation the other day. Like, what does that mean for us? Cause that's 18 years from now, 18 years from now, 50% of the jobs that currently exist are not going to be in existence. And so what does that mean for us? Well, what that means is we just have to think about what does that, what does that world look like? What does that universe look like? What are the opportunities? And we just started brainstorming. And one of the things that you know, you could put your head in the sand and be like, oh my God, I'm, I'm going to die. And you know, maybe my job's going to go away and woe is me. Or you can start thinking about, okay, what are the opportunities in that? And some of the things just like ghost kitchens. I mean, if you look at the amount of people in this day and age that are getting food delivered to them by Uber or uh, whatever the other, or even grocery delivery, you look at all these opportunities. And so like, if I'm in commercial real estate and I'm like, oh man, office malls, blah, blah, blah. Well, what if there's this, just like how there's a food court in the mall? What if, what if you take like a, a large uh, facility that has a, like a Chick-fil-A and a McDonald's and all these different companies where people don't go sit down, they don't go sit down to eat there. Literally there's like, say there's 12 lanes. This is what me and Tim were just brainstorming. Say there's 12 lanes inside of this warehouse and the Uber drivers just, you know, if you're picking up McDonald's, you get in this lane. If you're picking up Chick-fil-A, you get in this lane. Those are the kind of things that that sounds crazy. Morgan Housel was talking, uh, Karen, I had a call with him, the psychology and money guy. And he was talking about just kind of in the thread that you were just saying, things happen all the time that have never happened before. And one of the things that he said, he said, if we went backwards three years and I told you that this bat disease was going to come out of China and China was going to like weld people into their houses, you might be like, okay, maybe that makes sense for China. But then all of a sudden the entire world was going to shut down and they were going to close everybody's businesses and we were all going to be working from home and, and the entire world was going to be wearing masks and we would be forced to take shots in our arm by the government. People would say, you're nuts. Like that would never happen in the United States of America. Well, then you fast forward six months and guess what? So we have to be careful just even back from you know, the macro view versus a micro, we have to be careful with our preconceived ideas about what could and what could not happen. And also from a positive perspective, try to dream about possible scenarios. I guarantee you when Steve Jobs came up with the iPhone or, you know, the Apple computer or whatever, he wasn't, he wasn't living in yesterday. He wasn't, you know, he was forward thinking. He was looking at the future. What do people want? What are the opportunities? That's what we need to be thinking about. I, I, I totally agree. And that, that, that sounds like Wayne Gretzky. He was, he was always thinking about where the puck is going to be, not where it was, not even, there, not even where it is. It didn't, it, 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 it didn't matter. And I think a lot of people are chasing where things are. And unfortunately, a lot of people are chasing where they used to be with, with business, with how the world is and, and technology is going to change everything faster than we can linearly think about it because our, we're not, 
biologically, we evolve in a very slow, like uh, uh, the path is really, really flat. It's not very, it's not exponential. And so then thinking about how things change 18 years from now, when 50% of the jobs are gone, th the person that shows up today as a, as a zygote and then becomes a child. And then 18 years from now, they're, they're going out into the world. So when, when they were conceived, half of what was around when they were conceived is gone. And you, like, we have to be willing to reinvent. And sometimes that means demolishing our current thing. It, there's a, 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 a rule that, you know, don't, don't wait for something to break, go break it first. And, you know, like people have this idea that you shouldn't break something. If it's not broken, just keep using it. And that's interesting, except when you get run over and it's because you didn't, you didn't look into the future and you can start looking into the future. It's, it's going back to the, the drivers of trucks that is going away. We are on track. Like a big part of 5g is the technology that allows all these vehicles to work together and that we had to have the speed and China's already in the middle of 6G. So if you're a trucker and you're not thinking about what you're going to be doing, you're it's, and that, and that's not uncommon. That's just the most obvious one because do you know that that's the biggest job in America? Truckers. Really? I didn't know that. That's a, that's a lot of people all of a sudden saying, what am I supposed to do? I was making 60, $80,000 a year. And now I I'm literally, what's my skill set? Is it the last mile? I mean, I, I don't know. Are, are drones going to be uh, yeah, there? You have to, if we don't take, if we don't start thinking about that, if we're just out there doing this, anything that's mechanical, anything that's, that's the same thing over and over again, they're going away. Mm -hmm. Those things are, there is no reason and that here's, and here's the other side of that. The exciting part is that opens up space for us to do other things. Mm -hmm. This is like the capitalist idea that we, we demolish things that are inefficient with new technology and it opens space. The challenge, and and so Jeff Booth talks about this in The Price of Tomorrow, is that it's going to happen so bloody fast that we're going to say, ah, oh, like half the population is at, is out of work because technology, and then and then robots are doing things. Like if you look at vehicles, if you go to Japan and you or you go to Brazil, you go outside of the U.S., you look at manufacturing plants for for vehicles. There's hardly anybody there. Mm -hmm. It's all robots. So. That used to be you know, like this unionized worker thing, like, hey, hey, we need to have jobs that are good paying jobs, like the pandering that's done by certain politicians. Yep. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a dishonest conversation because the technology isn't going to go backwards. Yeah. And yet people are fighting to go back in time. Like that's very regressive. It's, yeah. it's very fascist. We, we have to understand what's true. Like whatever is, is and embracing that and saying, okay, what do I do with this versus how do I go back to 1950? Like that. And I think a lot of people are trying to fight for it because they actually understood it. And technology changes so fast that we don't understand it and it scares us. Yeah. Well, even tying that back into what you said, this is an industrial age way of thinking. If you look at everything you just said, you know, people said that the automobile was going to destroy all the jobs too. And the, all that automation, that didn't happen. But also you think about the unionizing of all these jobs and everything. Unions had their place back in the day. And by the way, I come from the trades and, you know, to me, unions are a cuss word when it, when it's a, uh, you know, from a business owner perspective, uh, I told my employees a couple of times, you guys go union, I'll close the doors like that. <laughs> so hopefully, uh, you know, I don't offend any union, but that's an old idea because yeah. the thing was, is we needed unions back then because workers needed protection. But the reality is in this day and age, like very few workers in the United States of America need uni true unionized protection because the reality is if we're in a free market, which I don't want to get off on a tangent on this, but if we're in a free market and we're actually taking care of our employees, or if you're not being taken care of, quit, especially in this day and age with the great resignation. And we'll save that for the next show. But the reality is we don't need unions anymore. It's an industrial age idea. It, it is. And it's, it's a great, it's, it's a great play for, for people that want to go, that are narcissistic, want to have more power. They talk about how we need to protect the workers. The reality is in an open market, people have options and it's, the, the reason that somebody doesn't have options and I, just to throw this in there, it, the reason you don't have options is because you're not, you're not evolving mm -hmm. and, and we have to evolve like me trying to figure out Instagram today. I, I'm evolving. Like I'm, a, I'm learning something new and I fought it and I was trying to stay off the dang thing. And here I am live streaming on Instagram and that, and that's, we, we all have to think about that. I, I think one of the things with social is there's this, this argument people have parents, especially they say, my kid is not going to be in that thing. And you and I've talked about this, that it's, it's bad. Well, it's social is like a gun. 
Mm -hmm. Like, okay, that gun can be used to defend. It can be used to hunt and feed yourself. It can also be used to, to kill somebody. Same with social. Like it can consume you and you don't even know which end is up. And it, and if you say that's that's right, it's bad. I'm anti-social. And then your kid wakes up at 18 years old and has no idea how to interact with people online. It's, it's like these, I, I remember some kids that worked for me and I'd say, can, I need you to call this person. And I watched these 23, 24 year old men act like I, I was sending them into world war one fields they were being shot at by the germans i was like what is happening cold sweats freaking out and i said okay call would text i was like no call would instant message would email i'm like you don't under and so there was that there was never any any like training on actual communication and yet is it valuable to know how to use technology to communicate yeah because so many people are doing it but if you don't know how to pick up the phone that's something that you like we've got to I, the point of this is that I, we've got to see what's happening mm -hmm. and not dis, disregard it or, or be afraid of it. We've got to evolve with it or we're going to get run over. Yeah. And I love it. Whether you're an employee, whether you're an entrepreneur, an investor, or you're talking about parenting, you said this earlier, but you know, if a train's coming at you, you can, you can stand in front of it or, or not, but either way, you're going to get run over by it. And I love what you were just saying about I mean, even kids in this day and age, Karen and I have been very cognizant about, you know, allowing our, so many parents in this day and age are like no video games, no, no online, anything. This is where the world's going and we're not prepping. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether I love it. It doesn't matter how I feel about it. It's coming at us and you're going to get run over and your kids are going to get run over, whether it's financial or technology or anything else. We have to be open to this. I, I, I love that you brought up the video games thing because I didn't even know until recently that there are these these competitions with stadiums where people watch and, and there's, you know, there's Twitch and these things that I'm like, what in the hell is a Twitch? And, and so I'm learning about these things and there's a whole ecosystem. And, and for years, I remember thinking, man, you all these kids are wasting all their time on video games. And I was, I, I remember being a kid watching, watching myself. I was, I was playing video games. So super Mario brothers. And then I stopped and then the games got complicated. And I, I was like, I don't know what's happening. I don't know how to use the controller. I, I remember that moment where I couldn't figure out the controller. I was like, I'm out. I don't know what's happening right now. And, and yet this whole ecosystem is growing and why? Because people like, people like games, because as humans, we like to play and, and you think about kittens or puppies. What do they do? They like to play. What, what happens with kids? We have recess. What are we doing to kids? Taking away recess, make them memorize stuff. Don't go outside. We like playing games and the, the video games that are are out there are part of this technological process. It's, it's how we interact with each other. And I think that's what Mark Zuckerberg has in mind. We're gamifying things and creating these artificial ecosystems. And yet they're, I mean, it's just because it's on a screen doesn't mean it's it like you and I, this is, this is real mm -hmm. and, and we're not in the physically and physically in the same place. So the, the, the video game thing is, is intriguing. And I think to discount it, which I've done, and I think a lot of people have done is very dangerous because we are more and more gamifying the what's happening with marketing online in general, it's becoming a game. Yep. Like everything is a game and that's how people are, are figuring out how to, how to sell their wares and their services and things. And so playing games mm -hmm. and interacting uh, and, and understanding how to do that, I, probably not something you want to just discount because again, it may be another train that's going to run over you. Yeah. And whether we like it or not, like you said, I mean, we're, we're, we're pretty much at the top of the hour, but when you think about this, Karen and I were having this conversation. Why do people go crazy about sports community? It just so happens that this generation is living their community online in video games. My, my, my sons are constantly talking about their buddies and their kids and all this stuff that are people that they've met online playing games. That's where the community lives. And it's no different than our sports stadiums. It, it, it's, it's really not. And it's, I, I think that there's, a, there's an identity if it, whether you're a cheese head and you happen to have your green gear for the Packers or, or whatever your thing is, I, this is just a different type of community and we all value community. It's, mm -hmm. it's built into us. It's, it's part of the, the, those six human needs. One of them is connection and we can get that in a lot of different ways. And, and part of that, that one of those needs is security. So if we have a community and we can connect with them, we're, we're satisfying multiple needs. So it makes sense. We can do that. And we don't have to try to figure out how we fit in with the people a block away. They can be anywhere in the world because of the internet. And so embracing that instead of being afraid of it or trying to block it 
is, is actually a really powerful thing because now you've got 8 billion people. And what are the chances that the people like you are all in your same zip code? Like zero. Like that's just, that's crazy. And, and now we have this amazing opportunity where we can find people like us and people of all sorts all over the place and all these new ideas. And so there's, there's, two, op there's two options, embrace it or fight it. And I have, one of them is going to be really empowering and one is really freaking destructive. Yeah, so true. Well, hopefully uh, you guys enjoyed our first dry run um, of the MD show. I, I don't know about you, but I had a ton of fun doing this. So it's super fun. Um, yeah, I think we'll, we'll be consistent. We'll throw it out there. We'll advertise what it is. Um, any last words there, Mr. Damien? I, I'm, I'm excited about what we're doing, doctorizing money. And, and uh, it, it'll be fascinating to me to see if we could deplatform for, for fake information about doctorizing money. Like, cause uh, you know, who knows, but oh, I, it, it's going to be a lot of fun. And um, just being able to have an honest conversation and challenging things like we brought up socialists that we both learned a lot from. Like, I think those are the type of things that are so unusual for people to hear about. And, and we're doing it in a, in an open, honest way. And it's, I'm, I'm excited about, about this conversation. I'm excited that we can share it with people too, because selfishly, I've been enjoying the heck out of our calls for however long we've been having those. And yeah. I think that there's going to be a lot of people that will be really grateful that, that we're opening this stuff up and, and we're, we're, we're free balling, if you will. Yeah. Well, and I think that's, what's so fun about it too. We both committed to just showing up and having the conversation like we would have it. And, um, I think that that's going to be the benefit of it. And by the way, as a side note, as you said before, neither one of us are actually MDs. This is just the Mike and Damien show, the MD show. But we are going to doctorize money and that's an official thing that's I mean, true. That, we're, that we're creating. So we're creating a new science, the science of doctorizing money. I love it. We'll see you next week. Thanks everybody.